Hey there, adventurers, and welcome back to another episode of the Awkward Dungeon Master. This week, I want to walk you guys through my process of building a one-shot. So every single one of my one-shots basically has some little nugget of inspiration that started it all. And for this week, the one-shot that I'm building has to do with this little guy. This is a unicorn miniature that one of my friends bought while we were visiting North Carolina, and she just really, really wanted to try her hand at painting miniatures. And they have never played D&D before. So I get this unicorn back from her when they came to visit us a few weeks ago. And it's basically all done up like a little galaxy. And she has named it the Universicorn. So I really feel like the one shot that I build when I go back to visit them the next time I see them should be built around the miniature that she did for me. So we are going to build a one shot about the Universicorn. Welcome to the quest for the Universicorn. So at this point in my dungeon mastering career, for lack of a better term, uh, I have written several one-shots. Um, I started writing them for the local convention that we go to every year in October that's called uh, Tsunami Con. I'll link it down in the description. It is coming up, so if you're anywhere near the Midwest, it's freaking amazing, and you should totally check it out. Uh, maybe I'll run this there. It'd be kind of fun. Uh, but in on their website... They have a little section about DMing at the convention, along with some recommendations for people who are choosing to do so, which also includes one about, I believe it's about time management for one-shots or writing one-shot games. But essentially what it says, and I have found this to be more than accurate, um, it's a very, very good way to gauge how much time a one-shot that you're writing is going to take to play is one encounter per hour. And when they say an encounter, they don't just mean combat, they also mean social. So if players were going to go out looking for information or something in an inn, that would be considered a social encounter. So that would take up one of your, let's say four hours. Uh, that's what I'm gonna write this one shot for is four hours. So we have to have uh, what a lot of the, especially the Adventures League modules call like an inciting incident or call to action scene. They've never played D&D before. I'm going to be really, really fucking derivative and start in a bar. Please don't judge me. I think what would be really interesting would be to have like a bard, like a cool bard. It would be a cool race for a bard, guys. Well, first off, let's get an in name. I'm going to borrow one from uh, my home game. No. Breaking things. Oh god. It's one of those days. Um, so I like to give each of my hour sections a title. And I think this one we are going to call at the Twin Tankard Tavern. Because that, oh god, what have I done? is an in from one of my home games. I think we pulled that out. Okay. Just ignore me, homies. No, we're not there yet. Computer, getting ahead of yourself. And I do have a bard in that world too, but I kind of want to make a new one that's a little bit more interesting. Not that my guy wasn't interesting, but I don't know why. Right now I'm really feeling tabaxi. Uh, the friends I'm making this for have a lot of cats, so they'll probably really enjoy that. Tabaxi Bard. What are some good tabaxi names? Um, I will say, guys, when I'm feeling stuck, there is a website. It's a fantasy name generator, but what I would normally do is uh, just this tabaxi name generator. Or maybe not right now. Fantasy name generator. Hello. How's it going? This website is slightly cheaty, but you know what? Um, DMs regularly run out of brain space. So, they have 
tons of different name generators to choose from. The fuck is a fursona? Fursona names. Ooh, cat people. There we go. Huzzah. So if we scroll down, it's cute. Um, I want to mail. These are not anything like tabaxi names that are in. They're nothing like the tabaxi names that are in the books. So let's come up with something on our own. We can we can do this, right, guys? It's fine. Um. So a tabaxi bard. Tabaxi typically have names that are like Russell Tree and weird crap like that. River Song. I know that's from Doctor Who, but please don't judge me. Um. Hmm. They're all kind of like nature-based and descriptive things. I feel like it should be something with whispers. Something whisper. What do you guys think? Because that kind of sounds bardic to a degree, so. Wandering whisper. Wander Whisper. Hmm. Because <laughs> I can remember there was some tabaxi in Tomb of Annihilation. But we had a flask of wine and river mist. I don't know why I freaking remember that. What about Whisper Song? kind of like that. And that can play into his uh, personality a little bit too. So if we have his name be uh, Whisper Song, I'll just throw this down in PC. Tabaxi Bard, Whisper Song. So I want him to be They won't know what a tabaxi is, so I need to put in some more descriptive stuff for them. This silver gray cat person slinks through the tavern with a small set of traveling drums on his hip. Excited. It's fine. And a twinkle in his eye. That sounds fun. Yeah, let's do that. His fur is iridescent under the firelight. Reflecting a rainbow of subtle. The silver gray cat person slinks through the tavern with a small set of traveling drums on his hip and a twinkle in his eye. His fur is iridescent under the firelight, flashing a rainbow of subtle colors with his every step as he approaches the stage. There we go. I think we should add a time of day. Uh, nightfall. Nightfall. Springtime. Spring or fall? Nah, let's go with fall. I was always more of a fall time kind of person anyway. We can have the brisk evening air whenever our adventures finally go outside. It will be fine. So this is all read to the players. Um... 
And I mean, you don't have to jump immediately to this. This is just the call to action sequence. You can give your players kind of time to situate themselves within the, the setting that you're creating. I'm very familiar with this tavern since it's one that I built in my home game. Uh, but you can always put in details like about the tavern. So, you know, is it just a tavern? Is it also an inn like this one? How many people can sit in the common room? What's the bartender like? Um, you can think of a couple other NPCs to kind of throw out there for your players to interact with and kind of settle into the scene before you present the call to action. Uh, that is something I prefer to do. It just makes everything feel a little bit more organic. Uh, but when I write out these one shots in this form, I am very kind of bullet notey about things. So it's not gonna be super detailed other than the things that I need to read to them. That stuff I fully write out like this. And also I need to take the bold off of this so it's more, I forgot to do that. Don't judge me. I'm judging me. It's fine. Everything's fine. Takes a seat. And it begins. So, uh, that's just something I chose to do. I might even put a different script or something here for me. Um, just because... This is going to be whisper song talking. So this is just kind of going to be the, the lore of the universal corn. So one shots are very fast paced. So I am getting to the point very quickly, but you have to keep in mind it's going to take your players a couple hours to kind of get to whatever your final interaction is. Uh, in this case, I, I have had kind of an idea of what I wanted to do with this since she sent me a picture of this before she actually brought it to me. And I kind of want the players to be going on a quest to search for this creature. So there has to be some kind of reason, like a boon or something like that. Or just plain curiosity. It sort of depends what motivates the characters that we have involved, which is entirely up to them. So I'll have to think of a couple different uh, things moving forward. But I want to create a story that is captivating enough to kind of draw them in to that. And then create a situation where they realize that this creature has been recently sighted and that's why Whisper Song is telling this story now and that there are people out there searching for the universal corn for various reasons, nefarious and otherwise. And then when the players finally find the universal corn, I want it to be in distress in some way, probably being attacked by another band of adventurers who are probably wanting to kill it and uh, take its horn or something like that, so they have to save it. That is kind of the, the storyline that I'm looking at right now. So, I'm very sorry if I don't talk a lot while I'm typing, guys, uh, especially with doing this as I go so you guys can kind of understand the process. It's creating a lot of dead space while I'm typing because I'm trying to think about what I want to say. So I do apologize for that. Hopefully I can edit some of that out. Hopefully you guys are enjoying some of the uh, dramatic readings as it were. Mm -hmm. I do like word choice. There is a creature. Veiled in mystery that walks the earth, shrouded in darkness and starlight. I feel like. Please don't judge me if my punctuation or grammar is awful. 
I just want to write it in such a way that it makes sense to me when I go to read it. Which is what you should do too. Um, funnily enough, I always typically tell my players also that when I'm giving them NPC names to write them the way that will help them pronounce them correctly. Because I always have those players who are like, can you spell that for me? And I'm like, no, just write it the way that you hear it. So that later on, when you need to ask me about it, you can pronounce it correctly so that I know what the fuck you're talking about. Because if you spell it out and you can't pronounce it later, I'm not necessarily going to know that that is the same person as the one that I made up. So, random hint uh, tip buried in this video for you. Please enjoy. <clears throat> but yes. Uh, writing things as a DM is much the same. Write them in such a way that it will make sense to you later. You are doing yourself a favor. Don't ever repeat this. Fuck grammar. <laughs> Do -do -do. There's a creature veiled in mystery that walks the earth, shrouded in darkness and starlight. It is said that she has the power to grant a wish to one of pure heart. Many have sought her for this purpose, but she is ever evasive. So, and um, I do want to say also, like I deliberately picked phrasing matters. So by using, you know, shies away from humanity, I'm inferring that this creature is not necessarily of the material plane. She is something other than. So even, like clearly she's a very special unicorn, but she is very much other. So, word choice really fucking matters. Please think carefully about the words you choose to use when talking to your players. Uh, that is also a double-edged sword because sometimes I'm talking to my players and they're like, what did you mean by that? Because I am somewhat notorious for being subtle so that kind of every now and then when my players pick up on something that's subtle but maybe not necessarily intentional on my part they will occasionally latch on to it and think that it means something just kind of funny to me I'm like guys it's fine i feel like that needs to be like part one part one of this uh, story. I'm trying not to get too wordy, but I also want to get enough in there that sparks the player's interest. So, slight intro to the creature, and then maybe something kind of nefarious to uh, round that off. So, the idea here is that he tells this short little story and it is both intriguing and slightly dark, but not... I just want to make it clear that this creature is one that very much takes in the energy of the things that are around her. So, I kind of want to foreshadow the fact that when when she is surrounded by people who are good, her intentions are good, her magic is good, and she is a creature of light. But then, when she is surrounded by pain and suffering and evil, she is a creature of darkness. So I kind of want to play on the fact that the Universicorn kind of partakes of both sides. The intention is good. So, um... Think, think of the Universicorn as like a magical empath taking on the emotions and energy of the things around her. I think that's kind of a cool concept. Hopefully you guys do too. Um, but it also has the potential for some kind of chaos later on. And I really like that. So what we have so far for Whisper Song's story. There is a creature... Veiled in mystery, the walks the earth, shrouded in darkness and starlight. It is said that she has the power to grant a wish to one of pure heart. 
if they can catch her. Many have sought her for this purpose, but she is ever evasive and shies away from humanity. The Universicorn has a bloody history as well. Many dark men have endeavored to use her gifts for ill or to imprison her with magic. She is a creature of spirit and energy, and in these moments of pain and suffering, she can harness and unleash a darkness so raw that it destroys the world around her. So beware, as the saying goes, all magic has a price. Just make sure yours is the right one. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like it's lacking something, but we're going to move on for now. I can always revisit it later. Um, and then, you can say here, uh, information, if I can spell, information, oh god, I gotta switch back my, uh, my font, so, it was my story font, let's go back to the old one now, okay, very nice, let's go, so, <sighs> information, <clears throat> oh my god, we went bold again too, what the fuck? So, if the players approach Whisper Song, which there are ways that you can kind of steer them in that direction, um, I know a lot of people are just going to be shouting, Railroad, Railroad, uh, but truthfully, most one-shots are very railroady, so you kind of have to come to terms with that if you're going to be running a one-shot. So, bear with me, it's, it's going to be a little railroady. There are ways that you can kind of uh, dip around that to make it feel more natural. Uh, I was playing a game with my friend uh, Eric, who runs the local convention, and he uh, he said something very funny on Sunday about rails and games. He says, I like to hide my rails under the sand, and I think that's a perfect analogy. So thank you, Eric. Let's work on hiding those rails under the sand. Um, so what I mean by that is, the players can or cannot choose to approach Whisper Song after he is done with his little song and dance. Uh, ha ha ha, see what I did there? But if they choose not to, you can very easily have the players overhear uh, some people at the next table over talking about uh, someone nearby who said that they saw the Universicorn. So... There can be some rumors around about actual sightings of this creature, which will then, you know, hopefully drag them in that direction. And again, if it doesn't, you can then have Whisper Song pop over and engage those individuals. And uh, even if you can just kind of drag your players into it if you need to, if they're listening, you can ask hey, is anybody kind of listening to this conversation as it goes on? And if somebody says yes, you can be like, River, I mean, a whisper song makes eye contact with you and kind of motions you over. Uh, so there are ways that you can draw them into that action if they're choosing not to engage with it that hopefully don't feel too forced. So just kind of be thinking about those things as your players start to play, uh, especially if it's, like, these are people I know, so I kind of have a general idea of how they're going to react to things, but you don't always. Like, when I run at cons, I feel like I really have to be on my feet, because there are some times where I'm like, it was right there! You didn't go after it. Uh, fuck me. Uh, how do we get this back on track? So, that is a skill that DMs kind of develop over time. So if you don't have it yet, do not despair. It comes with time. Just kind of start thinking about ways that you can circle back around to the point that you need to hit. But anyway, information that Whisper Song has. Um, so we can have, I guess it doesn't all have to be a Whisper Song. We can say, uh, other customers. I'm just going to put rumors of sightings nearby and then whisper song oh god what happened what the friggity frack whisper song 
So Whisper Song knows for a fact. You know what? I kind of just want to use the world I built since I pulled in the Twin Tanker Tavern, which means they would be at Breakwater Bridge. Um, the town of Breakwater Bridge. City, rather. Breakwater Bridge. Yep. Okay. Um, mostly because I want to say that um, confirmed sighting. Sighting at Raven's Crest. In the Iron Fang Mountains. Um, and he can tell them more accurately. Um, you can kind of think on your toes, too. Like, if they want to ask about specific incidents and things, you can kind of throw out that, you know, there was a, a group of bandits or something or members of a, a religious cult that were trying to use her powers for ill and you know they enslaved her and brought her back to their monastery or whatever and whenever they imprisoned her she basically like self-destructed and destroyed the entire monastery and the entire surrounding area for like 10 miles or some shit um totally make that stuff up it's fine um it's a one shot you do have to worry a little bit about continuity but, for the most part, not a huge deal. So, um, here we go. Hour two. Setting out. So this should be them traveling to that area, um, with, let's say, hmm, and it's a day's travel. Oh god. We do want to make it, you know, reasonable to days travel and, uh, one, or I will forget what that means. One day's travel and, uh, would that be two? I'm going to do one and a half just so we make sure we do an overnight because I want them to encounter... I want them to encounter some other adventuring group. Um, and I want this other adventuring group to be evil. And the players can either choose to engage or not. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, they can share their fire. Um, Let's change this to as they look to make camp. So we have the possibility of camping with these people. So now I want to kind of build a contingency. Mm. Adventurers. They find this group is looking to enslave the Universicor. Universicor. For last, for last, for Um. But in the morning. Obviously, there are ways around this, too. I like to actually build adventuring parties when I have a party versus a party, because it's more dynamic, so you can have, like, a healer and a caster and a fighter and all that kind of crap. Um, so, one and a half days travel as they look to make camp for the night. As they look to make camp for the night, they see a fire off in the woods. Other adventuring group is evil. If they talk with other adventurers, they find this group is looking to enslave the Universicorn. 
the other group isn't interested in conflict unless the party engages first. They can camp safely together, but in the morning, the other group is gone. Uh, if your party chooses to, like, set watches or something, you can always have, like, in the middle of the night, somebody make a perception check to see if, like, their caster that was on watch cast teleport or some shit and took everybody somewhere else so that they were no longer with you to get ahead of you guys um, or something like that. So that can make things more dynamic and interesting. So just keep those things in mind. Again, as you go along, contingency plans are good. So here they're either going to have uh, a combat or a social encounter. It's really up to your players, which is kind of nice. So that one's a little bit more uh, dependent on what your players choose to do. Is that a three? Yeah, okay. Weird shit is weird. Arriving at Raven's Crest. I'm not ready for four hours. Okay. Um, players arrive midday. But the universe of form will not appear until nightfall. Uh, if the other party got away, there is a 10% chance. I'm just picking a number because I want it to be kind of low. I would really much rather the other group find the universe corn first, um, but I do like to keep things a little bit fluid because um, that guarantees if I ever run this adventure again with a different group of people, it's not guaranteed to go exactly the same way. So I kind of want to keep things fresh and fluid and I still want my players to be able to affect parts of the story but continue on in the direction that I want. If that makes sense at all. So, 10% chance of running into them. And facing conflict. Okay. So, contingency plan. If the characters have killed the other party, <clears throat> when they find the universe corn, corn at nightfall, it is engaged with a wizard. Universe corn is weak and failing. Okay. It's gonna be a really long video today, guys. So, arriving at Raven's Crest. Players arrive midday, but the universe corn will not appear until nightfall. If the other party got away, there is a 10% chance of running into them and facing conflict. If the characters have killed the other party when they find the Universal Corn at nightfall, it is engaged with a wizard in combat. The Universal Corn is weak and failing. So, that is nightfall. Um, hmm. I actually kind of want to make this the final thing. So we're going to do that. Search the woods. Slash ruins. Um, in my world that I've built, uh, Raven's Crest is at the top of a, um, like a mountain ridge, but there's a, like, waterfall, and then there's a set of very, um, Stonehenge-like ruins at the top. So it's kind of a, like a destination-y, campy sort of spot within the world, but... It's also a nice point of reference and an easy place to have um, stuff happen. So I do, I am really fond of that feature within the world I built. So I like to use it for stuff every now and then. So search of the woods and ruins. We'll say DC, DC 10, they find Say they find some, um, not hieroglyphs, what am I thinking of? Like cave painting type 
inscriptions on the ruins um, that are new and inlaid with an iridescent. The, the depictions illustrate a darkened unicorn. There's a really easy one for people to find. Um, passives will find that. And then if we add in a DC 15 and a DC 20, just, sorry, I decided to change it. Um, just decided on a whim right now that the Universicorn really likes to like moonlight bathe. You know how like some animals will sunbathe? I think it totally makes sense that a Universicorn would moonbathe. So, within the ruins. Under a section that's centralized within the ruins under a section open to the sky or a DC 20. <clears throat> this almost guarantees that your adventurers are going to find something. So we have a TC 10, 15, and 20, and they can kind of uh, spend as much time looking around here asking about the ruins and what they're from or any of that kind of crap as they want to. I almost kind of just want them to encounter these people now and then just have a wizard be the final battle. Because this is not going to take an hour if they don't run into these players. This isn't really an encounter, and it's just kind of investigating and stuff. Uh, but this, we'll change that to a 50% chance of running into them and facing conflicts before they have a chance to investigate around the ruins. I don't know why it's being stupid, but it's fine. So, players arrive midday, but the universe corn will not appear until nightfall. If the other party got away, there's a 50% chance of running into them and facing conflict before they have a chance to investigate the ruins. So with this, I'm almost kind of forcing them into a conflict um, at this location. Yeah, I really... <laughs> See, this is why we do things in one hour sections. I may go back and change this to be a little bit more subtle um, so that they get away for a bit and uh, maybe give these guys some information to give to them, vice versa, so that this actually happens because I think this is a more interesting story. So, there. Come at. So, that is just the way that's gonna be. Oh my lord, stop. So, you can bold that up. Bold it up. Writing one shots is tedious, but also kind of fun. Fix this. It's wizard in combat, universe coordinates weak and failing. There we go. Thank you, D&D &D Beyond. You are my friend. Son of a bitch. It's fine. Everything is fine. Dandy and delightful. Well, that's actually kind of nice. Okay. So. Not too shabby. Um. Cool. Excellent. This is good. I think I want to keep uh, all of this legit. All this stuff I think is fine. Yep, this is good. Hmm. So I'm just kind of looking over the stat block right now because I know I want to to change some stuff for things. I don't think it needs ledgering, legendary actions. I think we can just add those to the actions list. And maybe we'll keep it. Maybe we'll keep it and we'll just so. I like those things, but no legendary actions. Instead, it's going to get, instead, three teleport, no, I don't want to give it three teleport, that's too powerful. Um, we're going to move shimmering shield to actions, 
one time per day. I mean, this is probably going to be a level one adventure, so we don't want it to be too crazy because the NPCs are fighting, they have to be able to kill. So I can't get too insane. So we need to take away these legendary actions. So it makes sense for me to make the other bad guys slightly lower, and then our party can potentially save the universe corn, even though it's a little bit damaged already. So, no legendary actions. Instead, we'll move Shimmering Shield to the actions column, and she gets to do that once per day. Um, we're not doing the hoovy thing. And then and shield and heal self. We'll move both. Shimmering shield and heal self to actions once per day. Just like her teleport. So there's that. Um, uh -huh -huh. Let's just say this to... I don't know, what's a good damage -y spell of doom? Let's go to ninth level spells and see what we find, because, you know, I want it to be bad juju. I'm using my, uh, I can't remember what it's called. Look it up here in a minute. I have an app that has all my shit in it. <sighs> I'm just going to scroll all the way to the bottom. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is Storm of Vengeance? Ooh! Yep, yeah, yep, that'll do it. A churning storm cloud forms centered on a point you can see and spreading to a radius of 360 feet. Lightning flashes, thunder booms. Each creature under cloud no more than 5,000 feet beneath the cloud when it appears to make a con save. Oh, yeah, that's... That's real fuckered up, guys. Holy crap. We're gonna do that. Um, zero. She can affect a... Let's do this instead, below 10 HP, she can call forth a storm of vengeance. I want this to be really fucking bad, in case you can't tell. Uh, if the universe corn falls below 10 HP, she can call forth a storm of vengeance centered on her current location. That lasts for the duration, no concentration required. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Storm of Vengeance, let me enlighten you. Uh, it lasts for a minute. A churning storm cloud forms centered on a point you can see and spreading to a radius of 360 feet. Lightning flashes in the area, thunder booms, and a strong wind roars. Each creature under the cloud, no more than 5,000 feet beneath the cloud, when it appears, must make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save, creature takes 2d6 thunder damage and becomes deafened for 5 minutes. Each round you maintain concentration on the spell. Well, she doesn't have to. The storm continues to produce additional effects on your turn. Round 2. Acidic rain falls from the cloud. Each creature and object under the cloud takes 1d6 acid damage. No save. Round three, you call six bolts of lightning from the cloud to strike six creatures or objects of your choice. Given creature can't be struck more than one time, a struck creature must make a dex save. Creature takes 10d6 lightning on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. Round four, hailstones rain down from the cloud. Each creature under the cloud takes 2d6 bludgeoning damage. No save. Round five through ten. Gusts and freezing rain assail the area under the cloud. The area becomes difficult terrain and is heavily obscured. Each creature there takes 1d6 cold damage. Ranged, weapons attack. Ranged weapon attacks in the area are impossible. The wind and rain count as a severe distraction for the purposes of maintaining concentration on spells. Finally, gusts of strong wind ranging from 20 to 50 miles per hour automatically disperse fog, mists, and similar phenomena in the area whether mundane or magical. Holy sweet mother of fucking god, that's amazing. Why the hell does no one ever take that? Eh, never mind. It's probably because it hits your friends, too. Uh, she don't care, so we're gonna do that. And, um, 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 with that, I'm probably gonna up all of my homies to level 3 characters, uh, which will make this entire adventure way more interesting. All of a sudden. Oh man, it's gonna be great. So I'm gonna put that at the top. Level three characters. Level three, it's gonna be amazing, guys.
Um, so that is the basic outline of that. Let's take a look at this. Yeah. Then I should be able to... I think there's going to be three, three or four people playing when I run this for my friends. So that should be about right. I could probably throw a CR4 or 5 caster at them. I'm just going to build somebody. It would be way more fun. Um, here's the other thing. So we did this. Unicorn mods. That's pretty easy. Straightforward. Oh, I didn't put anything about the wish. It has pure heart. I'm just doing really quick little notes. <laughs> this is insane. But this is a one shot. And it's supposed to be fun. Um, this is something else I've been thinking about too. I want there to be a reason why she's here. And I think the only thing that makes sense is that she's stuck on the material plane, even though this is not her home. And she's been trying for thousands of years to get home. So here's the thing, too. This is entirely optional. Um, the players will never learn this information unless they have, like, a conversation with the universe of Quarren about her. So if they catch up, to the universe of Quarren, and their only goal is to get the wish spell and the boon and all of that, and they never ask about her, they will never learn this information. However, um, if they do do this, then they have the option, and I realize that there's nothing in this for the players at this point, other than, you know, heroism and all of that and the satisfaction of a job well done, but they could, in theory, use their wish spell to send her home. This is a very genie, Aladdin, the lamp kind of situation where they have to be thinking altruistically at the right moment for this to mean anything. But I still want to include it because um, it is kind of, it's possible. So, uh, one last thing we need to put in here. So we're just writing the one shot. I'm not getting all my baddies and stuff in here yet. So we're just writing the story. Uh, if you guys have any other questions or if you want to see um, more of this, just let me know down in the comments. Uh, I'd be happy to show you guys more of this kind of thing because I'm definitely not done with it. I'm just kind of laying the groundwork right now. So, oh my god, I can't do anything. Unicorn layer. So there was some stuff in the uh, unicorn stat block about her lair also. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think we're just going to do a bunch of these. So we're going to do that. I'm just control copying from the stat block at this point. Um, just so I have them readily available. This is not going to be... I don't want that. That's silly. But all of this I think is pretty cool. Um, Maybe not the curses. It's not really relevant for a one shot. So we'll do that. Um, so, good line creatures, healing spell thing, and non magical fires. And this. Because if they let her die, they should have to feel that pain. So, here we go. And so, anyway, this is the whole thing for the basic outline. So we have at the Twin Tankard Tavern, city of Breakwater Bridge, it is nightfall in the fall time. Uh, so this is where we introduce Whisper Song and the kind of lore of the Universicorn and there's some ways for them to overhear some rumors and uh, if they go talk to Whisper, they'll hear kind of about where the Universicorn was sighted nearby recently which is why he's telling this story, because that's how he makes money. And then um, you can kind of talk around and get the characters in the right direction if they're not following it. Uh, but then the next day they will set out, and they will encounter another group of adventurers. Uh, this engagement with this other group, the other group is meant to get away. So you're the DM, make it happen. Then they arrive at Raven's Crest, and they can kind of look around at which point, either before, depending, so you, you'll make a roll, it's a 50% chance, you decide how you want to determine that, 50% chance of them encountering these other people, 
already investigating the ruins or 50% chance that they will accost them whenever they try to follow the path up to the top of the mountain where the Universicorn is. Uh, the Universicorn will not appear until nightfall, at which point they will encounter her already engaged with a wizard that got there first. Um, and she is on the verge of dying. Now keep in mind, if she falls below 10 hit points, this bad shit happens. So that's why we went ahead and went up to level 3, so characters have a slightly higher chance of not dying. But they may all still die. Uh, but it's a one-shot, so go big or go home, motherfuckers. That's the fun of it, right? Um, this is only, what, page and a half-ish? Almost two pages. That's pretty typical for me for a write-up for a one-shot is one to two pages. And I did not lie, it's all basically laid out very simply. So they'll have some freedom with this, but for the most part, it's all good to go. Let me know what you guys think down in the uh, comments section. And here we go. So that is all I have for you guys this week on building your own one-shot RPGs for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you guys have any ways that you build your own one-shots or any kind of techniques or anything that you use, please throw those down in the comments so that we can talk about them. And until next time, keep it rolling, adventurers.